First, let me say what a pleasure and honor it is to be invited to speak to this 50th meeting of the Society for Cryobiology. <laughs> Little did I know when I joined Peter Mazur in his laboratory at Oak Ridge in 1962 as a, when I was a graduate student that 50 years later, Peter and I would still be close friends and colleagues working together now in his laboratory at the University of Tennessee. In fact, uh, in just a week or two after this meeting, I will be joining Peter in his laboratory in Knoxville. So, uh, <laughs> while we wait for the slides, I will begin to tell you that cryobiology has a long history, as I'm sure many of you know. The first formal observation that I found, I ran across in a transcription of, <clears throat> transcription of a lecture uh, that was given in the early 1950s, and in that lecture, the speaker, a fellow of the Royal Society, a very prominent uh, physician, talked about the fact that in the 1600s, a British physician named Henry Bishop was intrigued by the fact that in the gutters of roofs of houses, there was debris which dried out, but then when it rained, this debris seemed to be moving, and he collected some of this debris. It turned out they, uh, there were little vinegar eels, or nematodes, that were encased in this debris. He then began experiments, literally 350 years ago this year, to freeze these nematodes. And as I said in the abstract, I quoted his description of the fact that these little animals began to dance about with great vigor. Well, so cryobiology then has this very long history, but obviously when I was asked to talk about milestones, milestones mean different things to different people. A milestone is something Thank you, Buddha. I'm, this uh, is all my fault. I should have <laughs> brought my flash down, uh, drive down earlier. Thank you. Sorry for that small interruption. So when I was asked to talk about milestones, I realized that's a bit of a problem because a, one person's milestone may be nothing more than an incidental observation to someone else. And that's why I chose the phrase, as you see, some milestone. So I apologize to those of you in the room who may quarrel with or quibble with my selection of milestones. And if I have left out your favorite milestone, either of your own work or of your colleague's work, I hope you'll excuse me. But cryopreservation has become an extremely important discipline, I hope, and I think you will agree, because you're sitting in this room at this 50th meeting of the Society for Cryobiology. What I have plotted here is the number of publications year by year in PubMed that have in their title 
cryobiology or cryopreservation. And I think you can see that the growth rate, note this is a log scale, so this is logarithmic growth of cryopreservation in the literature. So to the young cryobiologist, I would say the extrapolation of the line looks very encouraging. As other evidence of the significance, I'll say, the importance of cryopreservation, are these figures from Web of Science over the period from 1975 to 2013. And the reason, for those of us who were present in the early days of the society, it seems to me these figures, these are the number of citations that have these words uh, as the subject of, of the publication. For many years, those of us who were doing cryobiology had the feeling that we were, in some respects, second-class scientists, that we were not given much respect by our colleagues in other disciplines, I think this evidence shows that times have changed. So cryobiology, why that word? Where did it come from? Well, it turns out if you read the first issue of the journal Cryobiology, in the first uh, issue, Sir Alan Parks, a fellow of the Royal Society, described the fact that when they began to investigate the effects of low temperature on living organisms, they simply referred to it with the rather cumbersome phrase, as he called it, low temperature biology. But then he and others had the idea they ought to invent a new word. And so they came up with this expression from the Greek, uh, cryo referring to cold, and the biology, of course. Uh, in that first issue, he himself, Pox himself, says that as far as he knows, uh, the first use of the word cryobiology appeared in a lecture in a brief abstract that he presented in 1958. Well, I have to quarrel with Dr. Pox. He was wrong, in fact. In 1957, there was a meeting, uh, a one-day meeting, in, uh, at the Royal Society under the direction of Dr. Pox. This is a photograph of him. Here's the citation. And he finished the chairman's concluding remarks by saying, cryobiology, like truth, is a jewel with many facets. And so that first use of the word, as far as I know, was in 1957 and things have improved since then. So what I have now tried to do is to summarize very, very briefly what I consider some milestones in low temperature biology or cryobiology in the 20th century. And I begin with a publication by John Hammond, who was a very prominent reproductive biologist in England and, and a fellow of the Royal Society. In a paper that he published in 1930 in the Journal of Experimental Biology, he looked at the effects of temperature on the survival of rabbit spermatozoa. And the reason I cite this paper is, in his introduction, Hammond says, in these days of rapid aeroplane travel. This was, the paper was submitted in 1929, published in 1930. In these days of rapid airplane travel, that is 26 years after the first powered flight by Orville and Wilbur Wright, he said, if it were possible to cool spermatozoa to low temperatures, and they would retain their fertilizing capability, it might be possible to move entire herds of animals all over the world. 
in the form of chilled spermatozoa. He looked at a number of temperatures, but among other things, he showed that if he cooled rabbit sperm to zero degrees for days, he was then able to fertilize, uh, to impregnate female rabbits with the cooled sperm and in fact to produce live offspring. So as long ago as 1930, sperm had been fro uh, shown to be fertile after cooling. Then of course there is a paper by Basil Luye and Hodop. Again, in the early, in 1938, in a paper in this unusual journal that Luye founded called Biodynamica, they cooled frog spermatozoa and note in the title, they vitrified it in liquid air. There was great controversy at this time in the 1930s about the use of vitrified or vitrification. It was Luye's idea that if one could cool rapidly enough, biological specimens might be preserved simply by extremely rapid cooling so as to vitrify them. When they thawed some of this frog sperm, there were motile sperm when after they had been thawed. The other thing that's significant about this, of course, is that even today, it is very difficult to cryopreserve frog sperm. And because of the threat to amphibians all over the world, this would be extremely valuable if a better method of cryopreservation of amphibian sperm could be developed. In I mentioned Alan Pox already, and uh, it really is, I'll say, impossible to exaggerate the significance of his interest in low temperature biology. He was uh, in the, starting in the 1930s and then into the 1940s, director of the National Institute for Medical Research in England and he had taken an interest in low temperature biology. So he then wondered about the issue of preserving human spermatozoa, and he himself conducted a series of small experiments in which he put human sperm into, amp uh, into tubes of various dimensions so as to cool them at various rates in liquid nitrogen, and in fact, when he thawed them, some of those that had been cooled in liquid nitrogen to minus 196 were modal when they were thawed, but there was confounding about the cooling rate, and so that was a difficult problem. The significance, of course, of Pox's involvement was this was sh shortly after the Second World War, and he had a colleague at the National Institute for Medical Research, a physician named Audrey Smith. Audrey Smith had also taken an interest in low temperature biology, and there was a graduate student uh, who was interested in agriculture named Christopher Polge. And they started to, Polge started to try to freeze rooster sperm. The idea was it might be possible to uh, make the breeding of hens more efficient if they could freeze the sperm. So they try, the Poles tried all kinds of uh, methods of freezing rooster sperm. Effectively, nothing worked. Nothing worked and nothing worked. And I know that Many of you in the audience undoubtedly know the now famous story. One day, Pohl sent back to his, sent a message back to his laboratory at, uh, located away from the National Institute for Medical Research, asking the caretaker there to send him some of the solutions. 
that he had already tried. And lo and behold, uh, this time when Polj froze rooster sperm to minus 79 degrees. In those days, almost all freezing was just done using uh, dry ice as the coolant, uh, as the cooling material. When he thawed the rooster sperm, lo and behold, there they were modal uh, after thawing. He also tried, but the, the problem was uh, when he tried to repeat the experiments, now making a fresh solution, it didn't work. Fortunately, there was just enough of the original solution left in the ampule that they had it analyzed, and what they found was that apparently it was a mixture of albumin and glycerol that had been used to prepare histological preparations. So now they made a fresh preparation of glycerol and albumin, now froze the rooster sperm. Lo and behold, they got survival. Again, note in the title, they referred to vitrification. They also tried to use dehydration of sperm as well. They stated that they had motility. And that's been a bit of a, I'll say, a question since then. The explanation that uh, I asked Dr. Pohl some years ago to autograph my copy of his now very famous paper, and I asked him, again, the story that he has told many times, what happened, why did the solutions work uh, when they initially had not? And the explanation that he thinks applies is that in the storeroom in Cambridge, the labels had fallen off the bottles. And the caretaker of the uh, storeroom, trying to be very efficient, repasted the labels on the bottles. The only thing was he mixed up the labels. So in any case, by 1949, now there was the observation that it was possible to freeze spermatozoa from chickens, and they would be modal after thawing. They also looked at a couple of other solutions, including ethylene glycol, very briefly, but that was not as effective as the glycerol. Oh, I should, so here are his, again, uh, Sir Alan Pox, Audrey Smith, and a very young Christopher Poles as they appeared uh, in the uh, early 1950s. This is a photograph of the first living animal from frozen sperm, which Poles dubbed Frosty, and I'll come back to that briefly a little bit later on. This was the report that he published. Notice uh, freezing the sperm to minus 79 degrees. Now, I've labeled this the first living animal from frozen sperm, and there is this publication by Poles. The interesting thing, however, is that in 1951, in other words, two years after Poles' initial observation, a British veterinarian named Stewart tried Poles' method of freezing bull sperm using glycerol. He inseminated five cows, one of which got pregnant and had a calf. Dr. Stewart didn't even mention or refer to or let alone ask Dr. Poles to collaborate with him on that experiment. That paper by Stewart appeared in the veterinary record in 1951, but I don't have a picture of that animal. I do have a picture of Frosty. This uh, picture, by the way, appeared in a book uh, by Audrey Smith that was published in the 1960s. This is a picture of Christopher Poles at, in 1992 when he was awarded 
the Japan Prize in Science and Technology. And as I have often said to uh, some of my students, now you be a very good cryobiologist and do your experiments as you're supposed to, and perhaps you too will win the Japan Prize. Uh, th the year that uh, Polsch was awarded the Japan Prize, he received the equivalent of $400,000, which was more than the Nobel Prize paid that year. This is a, another picture of Dr. Polge that I like to show because he's for many, many years worked on both sperm and embryos of pigs. And so that's why I say uh, these are some of Dr. Polge's friends at the Agricultural Research Station in Cambridge. The other significance of this, of course, is that Dr. Polge fostered the work of many extraordinary young scientists who have gone on to achieve, shall we say, some prominence. Uh, one is Steen Willitson, and I won't uh, go into details about that. Uh, I will mention him a little bit later. And there are two other people that Polge encouraged as early scientists who have again, I'll say with some understatement, have achieved some success uh, in their respective fields. At about this same time, Audrey Smith, who was interested in low te the effects of low temperatures in a number of ways, began to do some rather extraordinary experiments, experiments that I would hazard the guess it would be impossible in these days to get an animal use committee at any institution in the world to approve. What she did was starting with rats and then working with hamsters, she would cool these animals to temperatures below zero degrees to the point that the superficial layers of water in the body froze so that the animals became rock hard. Now the, uh, the deep body temperature was still above zero, but the superficial layer had been frozen. And someplace, someone in the cryobiology archives has a movie that shows Dr. Smith having frozen a hamster, superficially frozen a hamster, take the frozen hamster out of the cooling apparatus, use its head like a hammer, and literally pound a nail into a board with this, quote, frozen hamster. And then as she put the hamster back into the apparatus for warming, unfortunately she brushed the ear of the hamster against the device and the ear was brittle and it broke. When the, ham the hamster was warmed up, in the cage you see the hamster with the broken ear and that hamster survived, as I remember, for several months. Dr. Smith published a number of articles, not only in Nature, but in uh, uh, proceeding, uh, of the, yes, uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society as well. But as well, she also took an interest in reproduction. And as I've cited here, she did experiments that again I think today one might have a problem certainly getting such a paper published in Nature when she froze 600 uh, zygotes, only six of which uh, survived the treatment. So the idea of freezing sperm then quickly attracted the attention of physicians and scientists in other parts of the world. And in 1953, only four years after Polge's 
initial observation of glycerol, Bunge and Jerry Sherman, Jerry Sherman, a scientist who was very active in this society for many years, froze human sperm using glycerol as the cryoprotectant using slow cooling, and in fact they produced four pregnancies in women that had been inseminated with frozen sperm. And it's fortunate, I have to point out, in these early days that they used uh, first bull sperm and then human sperm in these first experiments. If they had started instead with boar sperm or with ram sperm, it is far less likely that they would have succeeded or at least they would not have succeeded nearly so easily. Proceeding then to a somewhat later period, 1953, Another colleague at of Pol, of um, Parks and Smith at the National Institute for Medical Research was a man named James Lovelock, and he published two papers that have some considerable uh, significance to us even today. Note the typographical error in the title, but he looked at the effects of glycerol to protect red cells against hemolysis when they were frozen. And he concluded by analyzing the concentration of salts produced in solution as water is frozen, that glycerol acted in a colligative fashion to protect against hemolysis. And the ideas of James Lovelock still resonate and have significance for us today. He also, shortly after that, began to, he asked the question, does this idea, does this colligative effect of cryoprotectants uh, apply to other compounds as well? And he looked at 15 different low molecular weight compounds, including uh, methanol, ethanol, ethylene glycol, and sucrose, and demonstrated that these compounds several, most of the 15, also protected red cells against freezing damage. The limitation in those experiments was that they, he cooled the samples uh, from room temperature to various sub-zero temperatures and measured survival as a function of temperature. The problem is there was a confounding of temperature and cooling rate. Those samples cooled to high temperatures, say minus 10 or minus 20, cooled rather slowly. Those samples cooled to minus 50 or minus 70, cooled at a much higher rate. So a limitation of these experiments of Lovelock is a confounding of rate and temperature. Lovelock, as you may know, has gone on and achieved uh, prominence in many, many areas, not the least of which is his formulation of the Gaia hypothesis, treating the Earth as, or viewing the Earth as a living, in a sense, a living organism. Uh, Dr. Lovelock uh, is, as far as I know, still alive and uh, working in England. So, the other thing then that I uh, want to mention, also talking about Dr. Parks, 1957, there was this meeting and a number of important papers were presented at that meeting, one of which was by Harry Merriman. This shows results that Merriman presented at that meeting in 1957. This is a sample of water that was deposited on a cold plate at minus 196 degrees. Then he shadowed it and looked at it under the microscope. These subsequent pictures show what happens to this almost vitrified water if it is warmed up to higher temperatures, in some cases only as high as minus 80 degrees, for as little as a minute or two. The amorphous uh, 
liquid undergoes recrystallization, uh, even if the sample is warmed only briefly. This is a picture of Dr. Merriman. Uh, Basil Lujay was also at the meeting, and he presented results on his uh, observations of ice crystal formation in various solutions. Picture of Father Lujay. And as well, shortly after that, Peter Mazur presented a paper that I think everyone in this room knows about, Kinetics of Water Loss from Cells at Subzero Temperatures, the Likelihood of Intracellular Freezing. This paper was published 50 years ago, and I think the ideas and the concepts that Mesa presented in 1963 are as valid today as they were then. Since Dr. Mesa is sitting here, here is a somewhat more up-to-date picture of Dr. Mazur. That brings us to 1964, the first meeting of the Society for Cryobiology. I don't know that I can say it's a milestone, but I will point out the president of the Society, Father Lujay, was at the head table here. Uh, Harry, I can't see from where I'm standing, but uh, Dr. Mazur and Dr. Merriman were sitting uh, together. Uh, I was uh, in front of the uh, head table, and Dr. Rowe, I think, is here, as I remember. Is that right, Arthur? Okay. Anyway, as I said, now interest in cryobiology really began to grow, and there was a meeting that was sponsored by the American Cancer Society held here in Washington, uh, in 1964, and there, there's an item that I would like to bring to your attention. Again, this was the paper presented by Mazur, Causes of Injury in Frozen and Thawed Cells. I apologize for the long uh, statement, but uh, I hope you don't mind if we read it together. It is possible, therefore, that if cells are cooled very rapidly, the resulting intracellular ice crystals will be so small as to be innocuous. In such a case, the warming velocity could have a profound effect on survival. If the cells are warmed slowly, the unstable crystals may be converted to crystals of damaging size, such as Merriman had shown, but if the cells are warmed rapidly, the unstable crystals can melt before they have a chance to grow. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Moving then into the 1970s, uh, Peter and I were joined by David Whittingham in Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the spring of 1972. And we tried to repeat some experiments that David Whittingham had published in Nature in 1971. We were unable to do so, but we did develop a procedure to freeze embryos not only to liquid nitrogen temperatures, but even to liquid helium temperatures. That was a little bit of a, a game we were playing, so to speak. Remember, 1972 was the middle of the Vietnam War, and because David, the, uh, we wanted to freeze our uh, embryos in liquid helium, the low temperature physics lab was behind the security fence at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Because David Whittingham was a, quote, foreigner, we had to get special permission and a security guard to accompany him when we went behind the fence with our embryos frozen in liquid nitrogen and put them into liquid helium. This is a reproductive tract, the very first living organisms, as far as I know, that were ever produced from frozen embryos. And so here's a complete tract. Here's a picture of a fetus. And here's a litter of mice produced from embryos, some of which had spent a portion of their lifespan, in this case about 15 minutes, in liquid helium. When we did this, we wondered how long should we keep embryos 
in liquid helium, and so 15 minutes seemed an adequate period of time. When we took the tubes of, uh, we used little glass tubes, when we removed the tubes uh, containing the embryos from the liquid helium, the liquid nitrogen had, quote, frozen. The tube looked frozen. The liquid nitrogen had crystallized in the tubes. Uh, we celebrated by drinking a bottle of champagne that Dr. Mazur had won uh, uh, some years previously as a, um, uh, as a prize uh, when he calculated the point of no return on an airline flight back from uh, uh, Asia. Uh, well, then I have to say shortly after, not shortly, some six years later, there was the birth of Louise Brown, the first child produced from in vitro fertilization. Again, these are asides that don't relate directly to uh, cryobiology, obviously, but I had to introduce the subject of human embryo IVF. Uh, uh, Robert Edwards, an absolutely charming and enormously imaginative and innovative scientist uh, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine in 2010. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away last year. But then, uh, several years after the birth of Louise Brown, Alan Trounson and Linda Moore reported that they had produced a human pregnancy following the freezing of embryos using the very same procedure that had been used for mouse embryos in 1972. They froze and transferred an eight cell embryo. They produced a pregnancy, but unfortunately it aborted spontaneously in 20, uh, at 23 weeks. But the following year, Herod Zeilmacher at the University of Rotterdam reported not only pregnancies, but even a birth, and then the subsequent birth of the, from the second pregnancy, following transfer of frozen thought embryos. And uh, Zeilmacher uh, worked for many years on the crowd preservation of embryos, both of uh, animals and of humans. In night, that same year, in 1984, Greg Fay, I, don't, I haven't seen Greg yet, Greg Fay published a paper entitled Vitrification as an Approach to Cryopreservation. And I will tell you that as far as I am aware, this paper, which has been cited well more than 500 times in the literature, is the most cited paper in our journal cryobiology. And in that paper, Greg, who had been uh, promoting this idea of using vitrification to avoid crystallization of aqueous solutions, uh, described the effects of cooling solutions, in this case of glycerol uh, water solutions, under various uh, conditions so as to produce a vitrified solution. The following year, Greg and Bill Rawl collaborated in a way that has had extraordinary effects all over the world now. It's impossible to exaggerate the effects of this paper. Again, a paper published in Nature in 1985. Oh, when I emphasize that, 1985, because if you read the literature, you will read that vitrification of embryos, a rather new development in the field of crowd preservation, published in 1985. Their paper showing that they could vitrify embryos has had a, an enormous effect on cryo preservation, not only for embryos, but in many other disciplines as well. I can't resist, even though this was taken in 1977, I can't resist showing this picture of my good friend Bill Rawl having a rather uh, good time with his colleague Maria Cheslanska and a man, Ian Wilmot, who again has 
played some role not only in cryobiology, but in another discipline as well. Some of you may know that Ian Wilmot has been knighted for his work in producing the first cloned animal from an adult, Dolly the sheep. Vitrification. This, again, is a simple plot of the number of publications per year that have vitrification in the title. And in this case, I'm only listing those dealing with reproductive cells and tissues. Again, I think you can see that the growth rate of this discipline is extraordinary. As far as one other important observation, I'll say milestone that it seems to me appropriate to point out. A paper that appeared uh, in 1989 by Naomi Nakagata from Japan in which he showed that it was possible to vitrify oocytes which are far more sensitive to crop preservation and he produced live young from those oocytes. Coming to the end, I want to go back to this same statement that I quoted to you by Peter Mazur made in 1965, so only uh, whatever that is, uh, 48 years ago, talking about the effects of warming rate. Here are data from Rawl and Fay's original Nature paper. Note then that this is survival based on development of eight cell embryos into blastocyst as a function of warming rate. These samples of embryos had been cooled at very high rates. If warmed slowly, survival was zero. If warmed rapidly, survival was high. As recently then as 2011, Dr. Mazur and his postdoctoral fellow Secchi have shown that it is not cooling rate that is the critical factor with vitrification. In fact, it is the warming rate. The top curve in this graph is the important one. It shows that regardless of cooling rate, either high cooling rate of 100,000 degrees a minute or low cooling rate around 100 degrees a minute, as long as the warming rate is rapid, in this case, upwards of 117,000 degrees a minute, survival is high, independent of cooling rate. So in other words, the statement that Mazur made in 1965 was rather prescient, I think one would say. So here's where we are today. Millions, just talking about embryo crowd preservation, because that's a field that I'm most interested in. Millions of embryos now stored in liquid nitrogen of more than 30 mammalian species, all of the common laboratory species, all of the common domestic species, and many, many wild or non-domestic species have been successfully cryopreserved. Success meaning live young have been born. It is not an exaggeration to say, in the case of cattle, at least 10 million animals have been born from cryopreserved embryos. And although it's difficult to document specific figures, 2 million children have been born from cryopreserved embryos. So I will finish by quoting again Sir Alan Parks. He said, we have traveled, when he concluded uh, his remarks as chairman of that meeting in 1957, we have traveled from molecules to mammals and from physics to physiology. We have considered much of the available information about the changes which occur when a living cell freezes and how these changes may be destructive to the cell. Knowledge in this field is in its infancy. Well, after 50 years in the discipline, I would say we've come a long way, but there's still much to be done. So with that, I thank you for your attention.